I see a strange power shift taking place across the globe at this time in history. Things that once seemed powerfully persuasive are being challenged. Things like accurate information and truth. Things like justice and mercy and compassion. They used to be really persuasive things and now they're being challenged. These things no longer have the same kind of persuasive power they once did. And it caused me to wonder, what persuades you? What helps you to shift the way you see things and what you believe? What gets in the way of you receiving something as true? This morning we have two stories. Two stories. Jesus is doing a sermon. He's on his second point. <clears throat> um, that was a joke, but uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Gee, when I have to tell you it's a joke. <laughs> Just making sure you're still there. Good. See, Jesus went out and to his hometown. He was already recognized as a preacher. That's why he lobs up there and they let him speak in the synagogue. Not just anybody could get up and speak in the synagogue. But Jesus gets that opportunity. They were expecting something from him. And he clearly makes an impression. You hear from the, the, word of the, the wording of the story there, the people were amazed. Where did you get this wisdom? Wow. This is really something. It wasn't what they were expecting. You know, local boy, made good, could be you know, quite a good teacher, but this was really something other than that. He was one of those preachers that you walk away from and you just have to talk about what you've heard. Whether you agree or disagree, there's a bit of a, it gets under your skin. You, you can't just go, oh, that was nice. You know, sometimes you get to the end of a sermon and people go, Lovely sermon today. And you think, yeah, that didn't touch anything. <laughs> but when Jesus preached, people didn't say lovely sermon. They said all sorts of things and they couldn't help themselves, that kind of idea. They were, they were activated. It was really quite something. And he wasn't just a good preacher. He actually got down and did some miracles as well. Not so many as in other places, it seems. The group wasn't very responsive, and that seems to have had some impact on how far he could go in that regard. But I love the way the text says he couldn't do any miracles there, except he laid hands on a few people, healed a few sick people, this kind of thing. And I think, wow, how standards have changed. You know, if I just laid hands on a few sick people and they were healed, People wouldn't be going, yeah, bad day. <laughs> you, you see some of these televangelists and perfectly healthy people come up and they lay hands on them and they fall over and people think that's a miracle these days. In the day of Jesus, the standards were somewhat different. Jesus was a remarkable presence in a community and yet... He was not able to persuade that community by what he said and what he did. The local people could not see past his past, as it were. They could not see that Jesus was anything more than simply a local boy. We know his family. He's a half-decent carpenter, but so what? In uh, Mark chapter 3, there's a story of the crowds being so large around Jesus and coming into uh, the place where he was staying that uh, the disciples couldn't get their meal and it was a bit chaotic and this kind of thing. And um, some authorities come down from Jerusalem to say, Jesus has lost his nut, he's, a, he's possessed by the devil. And his family come over and try to persuade him to come to his senses. Stop playing this game, Jesus, almost, it seems like they're, they're saying. It's so hard to see past what we are accustomed to seeing. You see this in families all the time. You know, people have their roles in the family. They might be the, the joker or the serious responsible one or the person who organises all the events and all that. And if you come out of that role, if you don't perform the way that people expect you to, they kind of go, oh, are you not well? Is something going wrong? 
And we're just so accustomed to seeing people in the way that we are accustomed to seeing people. These people were struck by Jesus' teaching, his wisdom and his power, yet they are drawn back under the, their pre-existing assumptions. <laughs> this is not quite uh, analogous, but uh, I was at a friend's 60th birthday recently, and he's a remarkable man, and he's written a number of books and uh, had an influence on lots of people's lives, and uh, his family got up and told stories, and a few people in the community got up and told stories, and his uh, 87-year-old mum or something is sitting there in the chair, and she goes, don't go on too much about him, he'll get a big head. <laughs> and there's this sense in which, you know, we, we see people in particular ways, and uh, it's hard to see past that. Jesus couldn't be anyone special to them because they knew he was just one of them, a local boy. They knew his family, no big deal. The second story, second story is that um, Jesus sends out some disciples to go and do ministry in neighbouring places, places that aren't their hometown. Now, I wonder, do you like to travel? Anyone here like to travel? I don't mind a bit of travel, yeah. And if I'm traveling within Australia, I have a few little practices I do before I set off. I charge all my devices the night before, you know, iPad, iPhone, headset, um, laptop if I'm taking it. I make sure it's got all the media on there that I want to have while I'm away. There might be a series of podcasts or some uh, iBooks or audio books or movies or TV shows, whatever it might be. That, that's just, you know, the entertainment side of things. And you, know, you always have an extra pair of undies and you carry on and a little bit of cash stashed away, that kind of, you know, little, you'll have your own practices. I'm not going to ask you what they are. Things that you do to prepare for travel in case there's a contingency, in case they lose your luggage or you get caught somewhere or something that you're just not expecting to happen might happen. Here Jesus tells his disciples not to do their contingency planning as they go out. Don't take an extra cloak. Don't put any money in your money belt. Don't take a bag. Don't take any food. Go out as if you're just going on a day trip to your friend's place and they're going to look, out, look after you. But you're going to strangers. This is a remarkable strategy. It's a crazy strategy in a way, until you understand what it generates. And I think I've mentioned this before, but I want to really bring it home. Because really, when the, the disciples go out and preach, those to whom they preach cannot simply say, oh, nice sermon, pastor, or that's, that's really good, I believe you. Fantastic, thanks for telling us. Here are the preachers, and they've got nothing, and they're away from home. Are you receiving them? Because if you're receiving them, you're going to take them into your home and feed them. And if you don't take them into your home and feed them, you're not receiving them. Because they've got nowhere else to go, and they're human beings, and they're standing there. It's kind of confronting. You might almost say... It's manipulative, except that nobody is being coerced. It's just the presence of the people there in their need. And you've just heard this gospel story that talks about the giving sight to the blind and the healing of the lame and feeding the hungry and so forth. And you say, yes, what are you going to do? It's kind of confronting, isn't it? can't just say, thank you very much, see you later. You can go and sleep on the street now. But the thing about that, of course, is if they did invite these people in and they did allow them to stay, they engage in a practice of the kingdom. Showing that kind of hospitality is a practice of the kingdom of God. They are actually doing kingdom ministry whether they know it or not, they're actually experiencing the responsibility and the privilege and blessing of kingdom ministry. What do you think might happen 
when you invite somebody in like that. I'm not suggesting you should just be inviting people in willy-nilly or anything like that. But in this situation where preachers go out and somebody receives the message and they get invited into the home, I imagine they would have had conversations over meals. If it was a good person, the disciple, they'd be helping around the house as well. They'd, there'd be a bond that would form between them. There would be a richness of relationship that would become established. There'd be an opportunity to observe the way people behave and respond to people and a deepening of understanding of the fullness of what this message might mean. There would be a participation in the kingdom with its inherent blessing that comes with that. It's not a burden, it's a blessing. It's something that, it's life that we engage in and there's good things to be discovered in it. And that's what's happening here. Showing hospitality has the experience of offering kingdom ministry and this is really important. When we do kingdom stuff from a kingdom motive, that is because we want to do good for somebody, we receive kingdom rewards. We see the life we offer to somebody. I put it to you that there is nothing, nothing so satisfying, fulfilling or important that a, a human being can engage in than doing that which brings life to another person. And I don't even care if it's a stranger or a friend. If it brings life to another person, that is a moment when your image of Godness is most on display to you and everybody else. That is when you are most human, when you are bringing life to another human by your care and your love for them. And we experience that as a profoundly good thing. It teaches us about God. It's more persuasive than a thousand sermons. And I'm a preacher, so I'm just undercutting my own job. Paul said some things about uh, my grace, uh, he, he had a, a problem that he was uh, asking God to heal him of and uh, didn't get healed and uh, received the message that my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he goes on to say, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, weaknesses and insults with distress and persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And there's deep mystery in those words. We'd much rather be strong, and yet somehow the power of God more eloquently speaks for our weakness, it would seem. In first century Palestine, it wasn't uncommon to have preachers that come around, and they were some pretty good ones, I imagine. And uh, it was part of a pluralistic culture, so they're presenting different ideas at different times, and people go, oh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yep, I heard so-and-so the other day. That was pretty interesting. It was not unlike the supermarket of competing ideas that we have today. Lots and lots of different ways of seeing life and doing life and people preaching about it. There was no shortage of people ready to tell you what they thought or believed or to instruct you on how you should think. There are so many interesting thoughts to think, aren't there? There's a whole world of things to consider and I really enjoy engaging the range of ideas out there. I'm, I'm a bit of a thinker and I like to think. I'm contemplating to do, doing some further study. Crazy stuff. But ideas don't always grab people. It's interesting. Ideas are fun, you can play with them, I love them, that kind of stuff. But they can also be kind of aloof or not seem quite connected to daily experience. Eloquent wisdom is better than impenetrable verbiage or utter nonsense. But even eloquent wisdom may not be compelling. You can take it or you can leave it. Right? And powerful manifestations, you know, people being healed and this kind of thing. Prophecy, words of insight, even remarkable amazing healings can be amazing. Lives have been turned around by such things. They can 
operate like a circuit breaker in a dysfunctional life and bring us to our senses and help us to consider things we've never considered before. But for many people, even the most remarkable phenomena of the Holy Spirit is simply odd, inexplicable phenomena. I don't know what's going on over there. It's nonsensical rather than transformative. I mean, to be sure, God appears to have made efficient use of miracles down through the salvation history, but not everybody finds such things compelling or persuasive. There is a safe gap between observer and phenomena, and the observer gets to fill in the gap with their own explanation. They can make up what they think was going on there. That person had a mental health issue, or maybe the leg really was always the same length and we just didn't know it, or there was... Who knows? And so even those remarkable phenomena are not always compelling. They're not always persuasive. But the lived experience of engaging together over a period of time, there is something about this that allows truth to be seen unlike any other process. I mean, we can pretend to be something for a time. We can put on our best Sunday clothes and pretend to be a certain kind of person for a time or for a series of short episodes of time. We can, we can put it on. We can live like something and make people think we are like someone. But if you live with someone over a duration of time, you kind of get to know them a bit better. It's hard to fake it 24-7. And little bit, you know, <laughs> there's that saying, I really acted out of character then. And there's truth to that saying because we probably know the character. You know, when you think about a character, it's an actor playing a character. And there's more truth to that than we realise. And then sometimes the real personality comes out. They just get fed up. Like the kids, they cause me to cause that, act out of character sometimes and my real self comes out. You don't want to see that. <laughs> this is one of the horrors and delights of long-lasting marriage you see your partner in ways you never expected to. <laughs> and in fact, they change as do you and you relax and if it works well, then you become uh, deeply connected and that's a wonderful thing. Um, more than 20 years ago, Joe and I spent a few months in India and we uh, walked around slum communities with health workers, health workers that were embedded in the communities so that the members of the community knew those health workers really well. And we got such honour because we were with these health workers, these simple young, mainly women, who had committed their life to doing good in those communities. I remember going into a little hovel of a house where I couldn't stand up properly. I had to, there was, the roof was about there and this woman making us chai with loads of sugar in it which was a sign of honour. Sugar is quite expensive. See the, the rat droppings in it. <laughs> but they boil it up so it was all right. And it was a sign of how much the people valued these people who had lived with them and shown them the way of Christ. You can't fake that stuff. So when it comes to sharing good news, the most effective way is actually the most basic way and it's also the most challenging way it's not about fancy speeches eloquent wisdom great preaching all those things can help and i like doing some of those i'm not going to say i'm great great but it, it's not about remarkable events or incredible phenomena um, extraordinary healings or anything like that it's the lived experience of continually transformed lives. It's the most eloquent thing that gives voice to the good news. It's not a performance or a bluff. It is how and where we live that is most important. It's the way we live with people. It is in this living expression of the life we have received that people get to see what this life is about because we 
are the body of Christ. I mean, we are the body of Christ. We are the, the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we live that together. And it's so eloquent. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you didn't send us an evangelistic tract. We thank you that you didn't put on a great show for us. But you came and lived among us. And people observed you. And they observed the glory of God. We thank you that you have called us to be your body, to live in all our compromised and weak ways and yet in our faithfulness and to be the body of Christ to one another and to the world. Lead us and empower us to do that to the glory of your name. <clears throat> Amen.